Well, antivirus software no longer works. I don't want the, uh, uh, the feds busting down my door. So if you have a computer and you have any kind of antivirus software on your computer that says McAfee, I am sitting with the founder of that antivirus software, John McAfee. And a few other things to tell you about John before we get into it. He's probably got uh, one of the most, I mean, there's so many ways, stories you read about him that's just so interesting when you read about him. Former presidential candidate, I think when you ran, you ran on a uh, a libertarian slash cyber party. It was a you know, that's your libertarian party. Uh, 1987 founded uh, McAfee, and in 1996 he sells it, made a lot of money at that time. Uh, if, if social media was around 1994, 1996, he'd prob you probably have tens of millions of people following you on your you know, views that you have in place. So, again, I can say a lot of things about yourself. You say, let's just keep it simple and get into it. Uh, John, thank you so much, sir, for taking the time for visiting with us. Truly appreciate it. Uh, if we can get right into it, you know, so right now, you know, you saw what happened with last week, two weeks ago. Everybody's curious to know what's going on with Mark Zuckerberg, Facebook, all of these other things. And I know you yourself, having been on the other side when you're running a software and you're kind of trying to protect us. And in a space like that, when you were running it, McAfee was known as probably number one because it was ran by people who were extremely paranoid, which is what you would want. So when you see that today and you see what's going on with Facebook, what are you thinking about? Well, I'm thinking people are foolish if you believe you can go onto the internet, sign on to a social media site and expect to have privacy. That's ridiculous. How do, how do these companies make money? Seriously, Google Google makes money by knowing where you are, what you're buying, who you're with, who your contacts are, who you last talked to, where you're eating your, your dinner. This is how everybody makes money. And, and to think that you're going to get these free services, seriously, how valuable to you is Google? How often do you Google something to find out anything? You know, where the next clothing store Everything. is, what's on yeah. the movies, um, you know, something to help your children with their homework. Constantly, invaluable. What does it cost you? Zero. Zero. Please, nothing is free. Nothing is free. I mean, my parents told me that. I told my children that. What you are paying is your privacy. Please. So to be shocked that Facebook is selling your data or allowing people to have access to it, I'm sorry. That's just foolish. It's utterly foolish. So if you want to use free services, and you're paying nothing for them, why then are you upset that they're taking the data that you input and selling it? I mean, to expect privacy in this world where hackers can see anything, the government can see anything, um, that our, our telephones, our, our smartphones are designed uh, to spy on us. That's their design. They're designed. Pardon? They're designed to spy on us. Of course they are, because how again do they make money? The, they have application interfaces that let them access your location, your contacts, who you're calling, um, what you're buying. Why? Because marketers pay a lot of money for that. Now, that's okay if, in fact, um, all you get from that is someone trying to sell you shoes. But when hackers use those same facilities, or the government, then we lose our privacy. We have people watching us because these operating systems are designed to find out as much about you as possible. Did you watch the congressional hearing? No, <laughs> it would be nonsense. Mark Zuckerberg's got nothing to do with this. It's ourselves. You know, we, we want everything and we expect everything. Well, the world doesn't work that Interesting way. Interesting different point of view you're well, taking I, it from. I don't think it's a different. I think that most technologists would agree with me that, you know, once you log on to the internet, your privacy is gone. So you have a choice. Keep your privacy or go, okay, well, I'm gonna be very careful about what I input. You know, people ask me for my phone number, I just don't give it to them. You know, certain information you do not get. And if I cannot get onto your site, then I'll go somewhere else. So the only, uh, are you pretty active on all social media sites right now or I'm mainly sorry? just Twitter? Are you active on all social well, media yeah, sites I, or I mainly Twitter? I have Twitter? a Facebook account I'm not too active on. I have a YouTube channel, uh, but mostly it's Twitter. Mostly it's Twitter, okay. So whatever Mark Zuckerberg said or doesn't, you know the information is going to be used, you know, for whatever organization is going to contact you. So that's the consumer needs to know that if you're going to do it, 
If you don't want to do it, get off and don't share your stuff with people that they can't use yeah. against you. Right. Don't, okay. get on, don't get on social media sites, but they are valuable. So me, I don't expect privacy. I, I was not at all surprised that, that Facebook You was, don't expect privacy. Of course I don't. I mean, if I want privacy, I have to take care of it. I have to be careful about what I input. I have to be careful about what, what uh, media sites I'm yeah. on, what uh, machine I'm using to access those sites. Uh, if you input your name and your address, um, your age, you better expect everybody in the world to have access to that. Whatever you put down on any media site, you must expect the entire world to see that. So I'm very careful what I put down. Do I care if the world knows this? No. If I do care, then I don't go on. So, so let me ask you, when you were running McAfee for that, uh, from 87 to 94 uh, until you resigned, that seven-year period, uh, uh, was there ever times when somebody really tried to break into a computer system of somebody's and you got alerted where you were so concerned where you said, I got to pick up the phone and call the NSA or FBI. Did that ever happen? All the time. All the time. All the time. So that was a norm for you. Well, of course. I mean, that was, a, that was when viruses were first coming out and they were destroying people's systems, you know, destroying all of your data, um, doing terrible things. So, of course, when you got into corporations, people were losing, corporations were losing millions of dollars. So, of course, they called the FBI. Got it. If you don't mind us going back, who were you in high school? I'm just really curious. If I went to high school with you in 10th grade, <laughs> junior year, who was John McAfee in high school? Oh, I don't know. I was, I was a crazy character. I got almost straight A's. I studied hard um, and did not go out for sports. That was it. I was a nerd. Truly, you were a nerd. So you were not you know, partying. You didn't have the girlfriend. You weren't no, I playing had, the sports. I had girlfriends, yeah. I mean, nerds had girlfriends back then, you know, if you were smart. <laughs> Got it. So after high school, you know, you're, you're, when I, when I study some of the thing, uh, things that you, you pursued, you were, uh, I think you worked Xerox, Lockheed, and you were NASA, right, prior to starting uh, uh, McAfee. So at what point you said, you know, I just think I want to start this antivirus software. What inspired you want to start McAfee? Well, that was, that was sort of an accident. You know, I had, um, uh, I was living with my brother-in-law in Santa Clara, California, and he was reading the local newspaper about this thing called brand new thing, computer virus. And he was reading it out loud and said, give me that paper. So I read the article and I thought, good Lord, what is this thing? I mean, a virus, it could replicate itself, live, move from one machine to another. Well, that was fascinating. Um, so I sat and I thought about it. How on earth could someone do this? And then it occurred to me how they did it. And at the same time, it occurred to me how I could stop it. So I just wrote a little program and I've, I ran a bulletin board system. That was bulletin boards were the precursor to the internet. You know, I had 16 phone lines coming into my house. I mean, I only have 16 simultaneous users. But people would download software from one bulletin board, upload it to another, and in a matter of days, millions of people could, could access things. So I wrote a little program. And um, uh, two weeks later, five million people were using it. Two weeks later? Two weeks later. 1987, 1987. two weeks later, five million people were using it. Yes. You saw that kind of growth in two weeks. Yes. That is unbelievable. That is unbelievable. Well, I was the only one that had a program for it. At that time? At that time. And, and so immediately everybody said, I need to have something like this to protect myself. Everybody, right. Got and it. And I thought that was, that, was, that was the end of it. And then two weeks later, another virus occurred called the Jerusalem virus. And then they just started coming hot and heavy, and I had to keep updated uh, with all these viruses. So pretty soon everybody was using the McAfee virus scan. Unbelievable how this whole thing gets started. Yeah. So an accident, or just purely a, accidental. Yeah, well, I, I yeah. didn't expect anything to happen. I thought, well, here, if anybody's worried, run this program. Uh, when you were going at that time, were you connected with the jobs and the gates? Was there a relationship there, or not at all? No, you were, not you were there. completely not at that time. Not no. at that time. Mm -hmm. Got it. And and uh, uh, didn't Intel end up buying McAfee in 2011 for some 7.7 .7 billion? I think 48 dollars a share, some number like mm -hmm. that. And now today, you can't get on a computer without seeing McAfee somewhere. That's your last name. That's your name. That's all over the place. And so today, you know, you hear and you read up on it. How do you feel about the product now since you've been away from it since 1994? What do you think about the product now 24 years later? Oh, um, well, antivirus software no longer works. That paradigm that I invented does not work in the modern world of the Internet and hackers and social engineering. Uh, new hacking techniques have obviated uh, virus scanning software. It's, it's non-functional, yet... Everybody continues to buy it because that's all that they know. Um, but the paradigm is, is past. And I was the first to say it. You know, five years ago, I, I went public and said, 
virus scan software is useless. It cannot protect us from modern, uh, modern threats. It cannot protect us from modern. So what, how do we protect ourselves today? Well, if that's not the question. I mean, most hacking is social engineering, which is, which is problematic, meaning it's, it's using people rather than hacking into a system and um, trying to find passwords. You start calling secretaries or people in the company and you have a story and they suddenly give you the information rather than you having to hack into it yourself. Uh, this is 99% of all hacks today. 99% of all the yes. hacks today. Got it. So meaning that no matter what I do, if somebody really wants to infiltrate my system and get the information they want out of me, there's really not much I can do about it. No. Nothing at all. <laughs> Nothing at all. Didn't you say you designed a phone that's hack, meaning hack proof, nobody can hack the phone? That's correct. Is that phone out for people to buy it or not yet? Are you planning it's on going? Actually, well, it was uh, being done through MGT. I, re I resigned from MGT a couple of months ago because I'm, I was bored. It was, you know, uh, I moved totally into cryptocurrency. Um, but yeah, the, the phone is, it's pretty much hack proof. Pretty it's much hack It's called the cloak phone. And it should be coming out in, in six months. So somebody could buy it six months from now, I'd say. Yeah. So, so They said it will not be my phone anymore. It will belong to MGT. You, so, you know, uh, 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 there was a book written in the 80s uh, called Only the Paranoid Survive. Do you remember that book? I don't. It's, it's, it was actually written by the founder of uh, Intel, Only the uh, uh, Paranoid Survive. Do you think in a world like this it benefits, um, maybe not even benefits, it behooves people to be a little bit more paranoid than they usually are? You know, I think, I think paranoia serves its purpose. I mean, it's, um, paranoia makes you more aware of threats. It makes you pay attention. Um, I wouldn't say people should be paranoid. People should be cautious. People should be aware. But you need to be aware of the threats. You need to be aware that when you log on to the internet, your expectation of privacy is absurd. You're logged on to a, 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 a system where there are two billion computers attached. You know, a billion people who are, who are interfacing and, and communicating and watching. Um, you know, a million hackers trying to steal money from you or information or to uh, find something that uh, they can blackmail you with. This is the world that you enter when you log on to, to the Internet. And if you enter that world thinking, I'm, I'm perfectly safe, the, the world will take care of me, well, who the hell is going to take care of you? I mean, it, it's, Zuckerberg can't, Facebook can't, Twitter can't, Google can't. I mean, Twitter, it, if you go onto Twitter, there are, probably 200 John McAfee's, all with my picture and everything else, they're, they're all fake. And this is, this is in the news a couple of weeks ago. Twitter has tried to stop this and cannot. Too many people are doing it. They, they, they stop one thing and they, they come into another avenue. They come in with a different I, ID, but the same photos. How do you feel about it? <laughs> well, no feelings, no emotions, or no, it's just you either accept it or it is what it, it is? It is what it is. You know? it, it cannot be fixed, you just live with it. So you, you, you think we're going in the direction of living a naked life, which means, you know, I can, you know, nowadays I can go online within a five minute period, I can find out if you're a Democrat, Republican, what sports team you like, married kids, how many kids, age, you know, issues, frustrations, you can pretty much find out if somebody goes on there and spends five minutes. Do you think we're going in the direction where we are accepting our privacy being taken away from us? I expect mine to be taken away. I expect everything that I put into the internet to be taken away. If you put it on the internet, someone's going to get it. It's a fact of life. There's no way to prevent it. So what you put into it, you better expect the world to know. So I don't know, I, I use disinformation. You know, for example, I, I bought a house, in a new place in a foreign country, and I said it was in Dominica. Put photographs in. Well, no, I, I've never been to Dominica, and I do not have a house there. However, those people who are trying to find me are looking for me. I mean, you know, you have to figure it out yourself. Protect yourself by any means possible. Disinformation, no information, limited information. But whatever you put into the Internet, it's, it's gone, man. People are going to be lo looking at it and reading it and watching you. John, when you were running uh, McAfee, because this becomes one of my concerns. Um, you know how they say whenever you have a computer and you got the camera on the Apple computer covered up and put a tape on it yourself, so... They can't see you because they're watching you, all these other conspiracies that um, you have to be looking out for. When, when you went from zero to five million customers have an interest on in the product you're marketing within two weeks, 
do you, did, did at that time the government, a government agency reach out to you when they wanted to get information on other people? Did they contact you? Did you ever have moments where they contact you and saying, hey, we want to know a little bit more about XYZ? The thing is, I didn't know about XYZ. I was not in the business of gathering information on my customers. I didn't know who they were. It was, they downloaded it for free. It was free to start with. Um, I only knew who someone was if they called because they got a virus. Um, so I didn't have a database. I had nothing I could give to the government. Now, everybody in the government did in fact contact me because they're all concerned about viruses. And the government was my first major customer, all aspects, the Defense Department, uh, the Personnel Department, everything. So the U.S. government became really my largest customer for the first year. But I didn't have anything to give them. I didn't have anything to, I knew nothing. They were just using your service is what they were using. Well, they were using my software, but back then software didn't send home where it was located, who was using it, uh, because there was no value in it. Interesting. So Back then, there was, we didn't sell information because there were no buyers for it because no one had it. Back then, you didn't sell information because there was no buyers for it. Pardon? There was no buyers for it. Well, first of all, we didn't have it. Even if we had it, people didn't know what to do with it. Back then, it was, just, it was, a, it was a brand new field. Personal computers had just entered the world a couple of years before. So are you certain, like, if you were to bet on this one here, are you certain that uh, if a government agency, is a government agency involved with a Google or Facebook or some of these guys to get, I mean, that smile says a lot, but are you certain, certain of it that it's taking place? Uh, absolutely. Please, Lord, um, would any government allow Google, Facebook, Twitter, that, can, that has massive amounts of information on everybody, not just in America, mm -hmm. but in the world, do you think they would allow that just to freely go on it on its way? Of course not. Please, Lord, this is how governments work. You think I'm paranoid? Governments are paranoid. They're all terrified of losing power, of, of change, of revolution, of the world turning upside down. So, of course, I mean, it, makes, it only makes sense. Uh, if they are not, I, then I don't understand reality. I don't understand how the world works. So you are for what they're doing? No, I'm not saying I'm for it. I'm just saying, of course, they're doing it. I'm not saying I'm for it. I, I'm, I'm absolutely against it. So what's an ideal situation? I mean, if, they, if they're worried about revolution or it up turning upside down, what is the alternative? Not doing anything about it and leaving it alone? Well, I mean, you can, you can, be, you can worry about these things or, or you can actually spy on your people to make sure it doesn't happen. I'd much rather not worry about either one. Let's just continue as, as America, or as, as London, or as, as Australia, and, and just let things happen. I don't, I don't believe that a government that spies on its people is going to stop people getting angry, upset, uh, or want to change the government. I just think about it this way, because you know, what you just said right now, I'm processing it, I'm thinking about it. So if, 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 if you're going to come to fight me tonight, and I'm going to bring 10 of my guys, you're going to bring 10 of your guys, and we're meeting in pick at Clarksville, Kentucky, okay, or Clarksville, Tennessee. And you know I'm coming with, you know, semi-automatic weapons. I got guns, and you're coming with your, you know, hey, I'm a, I'm a man's man. I'm just going to fight you with my knuckles. You know, I'm just going to fight you here with my bare knuckles. I mean, you know who's going to win that fight, even though it's 10 against 10. Well, so if it's me, I'm not going to go. I'm going to have dinner with somebody instead. <laughs> I mean, it's like you do you're, have that choice, right? But, but the, I mean, the point I'm trying to make is if the government says, well, you know, we're just not going to do it. We leave every, everybody to themselves. A citizen's going to do it. And if a citizen does that, does, is going to do what? They're going to try to go take some kind of control and, you know, hack into people's uh, uh, decision-making process and see what they're doing. Wouldn't that be happening if it isn't already? Uh, of course that's happening. That's what the hackers are doing constantly. I mean, let's, let's just look at some of the major hacks. Uh, two and a half years ago, someone took 21 million records from the United States First Office of Personnel Management. That means everybody with top secret clearances, uh, everybody who has ever worked for the U.S. government for the past 50 years. Good God Almighty, do you realize what a, what a major coup that would have been in a war? Uh, an, an act of espionage of, of, of the scale of which has never been attempted. And it's, you know, some random person in, in Russia or China probably wandered in and just took it. It's so easy to do. Is that why you ran for presidential, you know, for pres to be a president? Because you said, uh, uh, I think I, I heard you say one time, 
what we are worried about, a nuclear war is the last thing to worry about. What we need to be worrying about is a cyber war. Yeah. Is that what you're referencing, that possibly that could happen one day? Well, of course. I, I think it's happening today. I think it's already happening. We're just, since it is a cyber war, we're not going to see it. We're just going to see little, little evidences here and there. Because, because seriously, a cyber war would be a very inexpensive war. I mean, Korea has 2,100 hackers. It's a group of government hackers with the capacity to literally take down any country in the world, including the U.S., by any number of ways. Hacking into our power grid, shunting the electricity in such a way that all of our transformers burn out across America. Now, we have no electricity. How do you repair it? I don't know. All of our, uh, all of our repair tools are electrically operated. Everything goes south. We don't have any electricity to run the plants to create the food and can them and ship them so that we can eat. Uh, we, we don't have the, uh, uh, the electricity to create fuel from raw oil. We have no, nothing to run our cars on. Uh, we have no lights, we have no heat. Hospitals are down. We have no emergency services. Think about it. Now, there's no nuclear war that could ever achieve that. There would always be pockets of, of we would still have something, but no. So if you were to, if you, you were running for office, let's just say you ran for office and you got elected over Trump. Okay, you're president. What are you doing to make sure that doesn't happen? Well, you know, number one, I, I, I had no intention of ever getting elected, no one in their right mind. I mean, I could never get elected president. However, running on the libertarian platform, it gave me uh, a, um, uh, a forum that allowed me to speak and to tell what I think the problems in America are. And that's, that's all I asked for and that's what I achieved. But, boy, if I was in Trump's position, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have a clue. I mean, you wouldn't have a clue. I wouldn't. Here, and here's why. It is so I mean, I saw you when you were talking about this. It sounded like you were pretty. You said, uh, and I think you were speaking to, was it Larry? It wasn't Larry King. It was, uh, it was somebody from Fox you were speaking. You said, look, I'm not just running because I'm running. I'm running because I really uh, feel this is an important issue with cyber war, and I feel I know what it takes to be able to help, you know, improve this situation. So well, if, well, we're, we're talking about one thing. That's cyber war itself. Yeah. Uh, number one, I, I would fire every, every technician in the U.S. government because, well, hang on, there, every government agency in, in every country in the world uh, becomes a, a magnet uh, for people who want stability, uh, want continuity, want security. These aren't the people who design new, creative, uh, uh, innovative systems. No, they're the people that maintain the status quo. Well, the status quo is all fucked up. Hmm. So, no, we, we, number one, get rid of everybody. Now, that, that's going to be very hard. Number two, restructure. I would, I would go out and I would go to places like DEF CON where all the hackers go to conventions, put up a U.S. government booth saying, we're hiring, all right? And I'd hire the people that we're trying to fight. And they don't look like government employees. These guys no, look they, they have a complete different look. And they look. demand to smoke weed on the job, <laughs> and, you know, and they have mohawks and, and uh, pierced tongues. And that's but they okay know what they're me. doing. Yeah, I could care what people look like or how they act if they can do the job. And so, so that's not going to happen either. Um, I mean, it's one thing to say I'm Larry King or yes, I know what to do. But in reality, in reality, I mean, that's politics. That's the ability for people to go, oh, I want to listen to what he says next. But in reality, it's, it's a morass of, of intertwined uh, tiny evils. The, the tiny evils of Google and Facebook, we call them evils. They, you know, the, the fact that we have no privacy, um, the fact that people are spying, the fact that hackers can get into anything and steal what they want, uh, the fact that our financial system is, is uh, uh, very fragile uh, in terms of if, if hackers really wanted to attack uh, America, a couple of thousand could bring us down financially. Um, why don't they? Well, we, we probably have the ability to do the same thing to them. Um, but no, this, this is, you know, we have let things get out of control. And we've done it because we are lazy. We are, you know, why do we accept smartphones that have the capacity to find my location, turn on my camera, turn on my microphone, look at my contacts, see who I last called, uh, find out what I'm buying on Amazon or, or what have you. Uh, why do we accept that? Because this makes our life easy. So you want to make your life easier? You, you don't want, you probably don't remember a time where phone numbers were in your head. Mm -hmm. What was your grandmother's phone number? You knew it right off the bat. Do you know anybody's phone number now other than your own? 
and maybe your wife's? I'm a math guy, so for me I do, but most people don't. I, I fully understand what you're saying. Yeah, yeah but I agree with you. For most people, yeah, you're not just, they just go into yeah. contacts and they click the yep. name. Uh, and so that's, that is a great um, uh, boon, a great, uh, it makes life easier. Well, well, nothing's free again. What do you think that costs us? Let me, let me ask you this. Do you think we're going to, um, if, so first of all, before me, me even asking this, do you think the election still is being controlled by the people voting? So do you I, think I, we voted for, or is there well, enough, yeah, enough that's, opportunity that's for manipulation? I'm on, I'm on camera, and you know, I don't want the, uh, uh, the feds busting down my door. But, but no, I don't think we do control who gets into office. I think we are deluding ourselves if we think that the voting booths, the unions, um, uh, the local people who control uh, the voting process, do you think that if that is truly absolutely 100% secure, honest, and not tamperable with? I am sorry, you're absolutely wrong. And so if it can be tampered with, if it can be in any way manipulated, then it will be. This is, this is human nature. So to think again that we actually have control and we're electing our presidents, you might question that. If I were you, I would, I would seriously question the reality of our voting system. At this pace that we're going, do you think we're going to get to a point where a 35-year-old person or 36-year-old person is going to end up becoming a president because they have a better, better uh, easier way of, uh, 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 what do you call it, they have an easier way of, uh, you know, keywords, you know, advertising, putting ads out, and they get the word out, and then boom, I got a 36-year-old president because he knows how to be in the face more than somebody else does. Do you what, what is Donald Trump doing now? What is his, his, his main uh, tool for communicating with America? used to be the media. You mm -hmm. call in, have a, have a news conference. Say, no, what is it? He tweets something. He tweets something. Uh, anybody with, with 25 million followers on anything, whether it's, whether it's Facebook or Twitter or you name it, good Lord, you have tremendous power and you have tremendous influence because you have the ear of your followers. So, do you so of course this can happen. So do you think we're going in the direction of the person that has the most followers ends up becoming a president and has the most influence? It might be. It might be. Wow. It might be. We, don't, we no longer uh, reach the, uh, the point where we're voting. We go, let's count. <laughs> okay, so-and-so's got uh, 131 million, then you're the president. Wow. So then but what's I, the You know, I'm, I'm being facetious. Yeah, no, I get what you're really, saying. No. But not really, and to, to some degree, can you not see that this is, this is a possibility? So would that mean that we would need to possibly, possibly reconsider our voting system if that's the direction we're going? Because somebody that has more reach, you know, has a bigger voice that can get to a bigger platform, even though somebody else has more sound values that's going to help protect the country better? I, I don't think we will actually reach that point because before then, all of our vo voting will become electronic. Okay computer control. At that point, it's the programmer who programs these computers that will choose our presidents. <laughs> I'm telling you the truth. I mean, that's a concern though, John. No, please God, see, see the truth of this, because these are complex systems yeah. designed by hundreds or sometimes thousands of people. The man or woman who understands the, the internals, the connections, the, the, the subroutines, the flow of logic, the, the most. You can put anything you want in there. It can't be discovered, it is too complex. Way too complex. The ba they're, they're called back doors for hackers uh, for this. I don't know what you want to call it, but you could put in there something where, where you, uh, thank you, Jimmy, where you um, say, okay, well, you know, we're gonna decide who we wanna have present, and, and when voting comes, I'm just gonna tell all my machines you know, give 51% to this person and 49 to that person. Do you know how trivial that would be? That's what I'm saying. I mean, if that's the direction we're going to right now where um, the person with the biggest following ends up winning, you know, then there may be a time that we need to reconsider ways. Um, and, and by the way, just out of curiosity, how do you feel, as, as just so the viewer knows and I know, how do you feel about Trump as a president himself? I like Trump. Okay. Got it. Like so th you're not saying anything he's, where indirectly you're taking a shot at Trump saying because oh, he's got a lot of followers, oh, he not. became a president. No, that's no, not your point. Not. I think, uh, first of all, I think the, the Twitter move was very smart. He bypasses because presidents are held hostage by the media. You get to do a press conference, they get to edit what they want. Mm. They get to put in there 
uh, their own skew, their own color, their own flavor to what you have said. Mm -hmm. by, you can do it easily enough by simply cutting things out, uh, re reorganizing things in terms of time sequence or whatever, or focusing on the biggest faux pas that you made. Well, no. If you are doing it yourself in these tiny bites of you know, 100 and, uh, 280 characters, the media is locked out. The media is shut out. They have no more power, no more control. Thank God for that. They hate that. Thank, well, but the, the good. They yeah. should. You know, I, I, no, no, no disrespect to you and, and you guys, but honestly, this is what is wrong with this country and every country. The, the information flow funneled through a few faces, a few uh, uh, agencies, a few stations, Fox, CNN, CNBC. That's the problem. Because if you watch the news, is it news? I mean, on some stations there are women with, with leather, you know, leather vests and, and low-cut blouse. Bullshit, this is all, it's drama. It's who, entertainment. Who, it's it's self, uh, you know, self-aggrandizement by the news anchors. Who do you actually listen to? Is there anybody where you say, I, I, I respect and value this person's opinion? Anybody in the media that you say, this guy is half decent when he talks? No. Nobody? Nobody. So you're valuing everything that's happening. You're trying to see what the, you know, motive behind it is or how do you intake it? Because again, going back to it, going back to it. Um, you know, like I said earlier, we trusted McAfee because the guy running it was extremely cautious and paranoid. And he had to make sure that, hey, you pay me for this service because you don't have to worry about somebody hacking your computer because I know exactly how hackers think. So we said, here you go, 89 bucks. Here you go, $69. We trust you. Keep doing what you're doing. As somebody that is as paranoid and, and it's wired the way you are. I mean, we're sitting in a place, you got people protecting, you got, you got a piece on the side. So it's not like we're, oh, you know, no, it's totally fine. I was in the military. So we're sitting here and, you know, uh, uh, you are pretty protective of your personal life and your liberties and the choices that you're making. But knowing that, and if this is where we're going, I mean, what is the real solution to it? You notice that, that I am protecting myself. I have, I have hired my security. I am carrying the peace. I have structured my life to protect myself. So step one is don't ask someone else to do it for you. Don't expect the government, don't expect your police. Sure, they are designed to do this, but if someone breaks into my house, puts a gun to my head, is there a magic button that I can push that makes a policeman immediately materialize between me and the attacker? No, please God, they are there they're not there to protect, even though it says protect and serve. They come in after the mess, clean up, and try to find the perpetrator and prosecute him. That's what this is all about. Nobody's protecting you. You want Mark Zuckerberg to protect your privacy? Good God, please. He has no capacity to do so. Neither is it his job, right? It's our jobs as citizens to make sure we take care of ourselves. Uh, that's, that's as I see it. If, yeah. if you're over the age of 21, then please God, don't expect someone else to make your decisions, to weigh the alternatives to protect yourself and your family. It's your responsibility. So, so let me ask you, did you, so again, uh, follow up on this, where do you consume your information from? Or do you at all consume any content? Do you consume any information yourself? I, I get it straight from the source if I can. I mean, I, if I, you know, if, if, they're, if they're reporting on something that's happening in the Middle East, I'm gonna go to a Middle East station, a Middle East newspaper and find out from them. They're there. They're there. Got it. You get your source from let, them. Let's, let's, let's get it from multiple sources, balance them out. Uh, but in most cases, I just don't care because it's all the same. Were well, you like this also in 1986? Yeah, always. So in 1986, you're not consuming any content, opinions, you know, Walter Cronk, somebody sent Buckley or good Vidal? Absolutely not. No, not that I did not keep my ear to the ground, uh, but I was concerned with computer viruses and security. Uh, all those people, I definitely, I was listening to them. What did you discover yesterday? What about this virus? Where do you think this is going? Do, do you think... Uh, 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 and let me tell you why, please. I don't want to sound cynical and, and uh, obtuse. But what is the purpose of, of the media? Is it not to make money? Seriously, please God, whoever you work for, they're, they're expecting you to make money. How do you make money? By creating the most interesting content. If it's news, the most interesting story. If it's not interesting, you damn well better make it interesting. And how do you make it interesting? You find some perspective, some weird, strange perspective. Oh, look at this from this angle. What a horrible person, what a horrible event. 
Why? Because I, I, we're traveling down the highway and there's a, a massive accident. What happens? Everything stops to a standstill. Well, I want to see it. As the grandmother baking pies by the highway, do we give a shit? No, we do not. It's human nature. And so in order to make money, which is your job, this, you're doing this to make money. Are you doing this for free? This I'm not making money on. I run a financial firm. This is just a YouTube channel we have. I don't work for Fox, CNN, okay, MSNBC. Okay, it's for a YouTube yeah. channel. But eventually you expect to make money off of this somehow. I, oh, no doubt about directly it. Yeah. Directly, yeah. Sure, okay. absolutely. No. I mean, it's like you running McAfee, right? You're running it to make money. But partially, I agree with what you're saying on the part that, and that's one of the reasons why I'm asking you. I'm asking you to know if somebody's watching this thing, so where do I get my source where I can say, you know, my opinion is always watch both sides to kind of get the argument. If somebody's building this side up, study the other side. If somebody's building this side up, watch the other side. But how do you know what information is coming? Maybe well, someone well, doesn't well, have well, your well, kind well, of resources. Common sense. Let's start with the fact that they're there to make money. So obviously, you're going to try to beef up your story in such a way that you make the most money. How do you do that? You get the most views. How do you get the most views? To have the most radical story or the most unusual. I don't think anybody would disagree with that. I think. Okay, so let's yeah. start with this. Let's start with that. So I'm watching the news and somebody says something and they're focusing on this. My first question is, that just doesn't sound right. I'm sorry. It just doesn't sound like human nature. I mean, because what is human nature? We are loving people. We are, we are, um, hopeful, we have dreams, and, and uh, we're compassionate, we have grace, but don't we also have anger and fear? Aren't we jealous people? Aren't we greedy people? Well, take that package and you put that inside, or put that in the guy who's telling you the story, because that's who's telling the story. The guy who has, thank you sir, the guy who has grace, compassion, fear, jealousy, and greed, okay, that's who's telling the story. Each of these things are going to manifest in the story. You're getting the story through this man. You're not getting the story. The story would be the man shutting, shutting up and just showing videos. This, 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 and you figure it out. No, instead, we have a commentator, someone who will explain this to you. You're over 21. Do you need stuff explained to you? Please, if you do, then you, know, you, you, you need to do something with yourself. If you don't, why are you even watching this? Why are you even watching someone tell you what's really happening? So you're actually saying don't consume content. No, what, what's the point? <laughs> okay, complete different perspective. Interesting. So, so let me ask you to follow up on that. Do you, do you actually believe that Russia did have any kind of involvement in it or no? That's not, you, you, to you, it's, I don't think Russia had anything to do with the election. I'm, I'm almost certain that at least from a hacking standpoint, that Russia had nothing to do with it. From the hacking standpoint? From the hacking of the DNC, all of these other things. From the no, absolutely. Why? Because everything pointed to the Russians. Think about it. All right, so the DNC, they they found the malware. It had the Russian language. It had a compile time that matched the business hours in Moscow. It had a Cyrillic keyboard that was used. That's the Russian keyboard that's, that's used to create the program. Um, on and on and on. Please, God, do you think that anyone in the Kremlin, anybody who is part of the Russian state, now imagine, uh, uh, Igor, uh, you left your name in the program. Oh, you know, I'm sorry, boss. My, my wife was sick. I ran home at lunch. I forgot. Do you think that actually happens? Please, God, no. You don't leave your language the time of the compile, names, the type of keyboards you use, everything that points to you as Russia? Do you actually think the CIA or the NSA would do that? Yeah, we're gonna hack Russia, but uh, we don't care if what, what, you know, leave the, leave the English language in there, put Washington in there. No, please God, you hide it. So you're not gonna do something at, at that level, something that, uh, that horrific, and be lax about writing the program that actually does it. This is the typical thing that hackers do to point away from themselves and toward their worst enemy. Kind of like when you said the house, you bought a house recently and you said my house is located in this area, but I've never been to that place before. No, why? I don't, I don't want right? people knowing where I live. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 okay, to follow up on that, so you uh, I think at one point you worked with uh, uh, Booz Allen as a, the, one of the top five consulting firms. And I think 
Snowden also worked there at some point. He worked there as well himself. Obviously, different responsibilities, but you know they have a lot of credibility for what they do. Uh, what do you think a Snowden is, or some of these whistleblowers are for the marketplace? Do you think they do good, or do you think, do you think they do bad for the information they're given, given to us when we see? All of a sudden, you're like, oh my gosh, this is really what happened. Should I believe it? Should I not believe it? MSNBC say, you shouldn't read it anyway. It's private information. It shouldn't be something you should do. You should be embarrassed of yourself if you read it. Oh, you should read it. What do you think about a Snowden in the marketplace? First and foremost, you're taking Snowden, the definition, the, the character, the, the, uh, uh, the person, as created by the media, as the truth. That he, in fact, did, well, he did, in fact, work for Booz Allen. Uh, he was a whistleblower. He ended up in Russia, da 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 Do you realize how many other alternatives there are? That, yes, that he still works for the CIA, and this is some massive disinformation thing that is keeping the world occupied while the CIA does something totally different. Do you think that's not a possibility? Do you think there are 10,000 10, different ways we can define what Edward Snowden is and why he did what he did? Is it good for the market? Well, hell yes. Anything that brings attention to any specific uh, area of life is good for that area of life. That's a, a fact of life. Um, whether it's good or whether it's bad. I mean, uh, P.T. Barnum said it the best. There is no such thing as bad press, if they spell your name right. Because in the end, people remember the name and everything else gets lost in the shuffle of life. But so yes, to so, read into it is yes. that is that a good thing? Is is it is is me the 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 person that's trying to use my common sense to come up with a proper opinion, an educated opinion? Should I take his information and say, I'm going to consider this when it comes down to poll time to vote? Uh, if, if you think he's a whistleblower, then you would take that information and use it for the good. If you think it's it's disinformation that was planned ten years ago by the CIA, and Edward Snowden is one of these great actors. Um, I mean, first and foremost, please, why didn't anybody ask how he ended up in Russia? If you go back and watch things, he was in Hong Kong, all right? Mm -hmm. now, if I was in Hong Kong, I was really on the run. I would just fade into the back alleys of Hong Kong. I'm a technician, you know, uh, grab some cute little, uh, uh, you know, Hong Kong girl and get an apartment somewhere and live happily ever after. Um, but he was on his way to Ecuador. Keep this in mind. Was he not? Mm -hmm. He was on his way to Ecuador. Why? Well, Ecuador is the place that once you get there, you know, you're not gonna, no one's going to get you out. How? From Hong Kong, he goes to Russia to then go to Ecuador. And when he gets to Russia, he's not allowed to leave. Now, right off the bat, my, you know, I travel a lot. And I know the routes that people take. Um, if I want to get to... Um, to Ecuador from Hong Kong, the last country in the world I'd go through is Russia. You've got 50 different options, or even direct flights from Hong mm. Kong to Ecuador. Why the heck is he going through um, Russia? So, um, so I, you know, it's hard for me to say: Is it good? Is it bad? I don't have all the facts, and neither do you, and neither do any of you. You have the facts that the media has given you. End of story. And the media, as we are well aware, will modify stories according to how much money they're going to make from this story. End of story. So, uh, you know, James Comey just came out with a new book. Uh, it's called A Higher Loyalty. What do you think about James Comey in this whole situation? You know, one minute he's saying, here's what happened. Another minute he's saying, that's what happened. What do you think about James Comey's position right now? Or do you have an opinion on it at all? I only have opinions on things I have personal experience with. My only personal experience with James Comey is a year and a half ago when the FBI wanted a master key for the, uh, uh, the iPhone that was taken from the shooter in California, mm -hmm. the quote terrorist, wanted a master key. I got up in arms because that would be the worst thing that ever happened in the world. And so on a Wednesday, um, and this is all documented, on a Wednesday I had a 15-minute debate with the, uh, James Rogers, who is the mouthpiece of the FBI, one of the slickest characters I have ever come up against. So we had a 15-minute debate. But, but I really researched his background. No way to win a debate on his terms. And, and because he comes in saying, you want privacy or security? So I changed the debate at the, at the table and said, well, I'm not, I don't know anything about privacy versus security. I wish I did. We could talk about it. 
but I'm more, I would like to talk about security versus less security. Because if you get a master key, America's going to be less secure. Okay, so that sort of threw him off. And at the end, he said, well, maybe we can work together. Okay, that was on a Wednesday. On a Monday, James Comey, and by the way, I said, please give me the phone. I will unlock it and give it back to you tomorrow. I said that publicly more times than, than once. Everybody knew. On Monday, James Comey is testifying in Congress. The specific question was, Mr. Comey, have you pursued every offer of help? He said, yes, we have. That sort of bullshit. Nobody ever called me after that. Mm. Nobody ever called me. And I'd been talking for two weeks saying, I will unlock the phone. So, no, they did not pursue my offer of help. And to think that Mr. Comey would not be aware that I had offered to help after this CNN, you know, national broadcast, it's, it's, it's untenable to think he did not know that. So in Congress, he lied. He li lied to Congress. Do you realize what an offense that is in America? He said, yes, sir, we have pursued every avenue. Not one FBI agent, no one, not even a secretary, called me to say, well, what are your terms? Can you really do it? No, they did not pursue my offer of help. That's all I know about Mr. Comey, and that's all I can say. What conclusion do you come up with that, or do you come up with any conclusion? <laughs> the FBI, like any law enforcement agency from local police on up that has enormous power, will have enormous corruption. I mean, power corrupts. It does. If you, if you don't see that or, or know that, but please read some of the philosophers or you know, just do some Google searches. Power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. The FBI is a very powerful organization, so of course they have corruption. Now, it's not universal, it's not every agent, but it's a lot. It has to be. And it certainly affected Mr. Comey. This is all I know personally about the man. This is not secondhand information. This is my observation having dealt with the FBI at that level. Should the average citizen trust the FBI based on what you're saying? <laughs> the average person shouldn't trust anybody. I mean, I don't want to be cynical again. But please, what does that mean? Trust somebody. I mean, please, let's get down to the nitty gritty. I mean, anybody in a time of war who's ever been tortured or was a torturer knows the following. You will talk. You will turn in your mother if the pain is intense enough and long enough. This is a fact of life. So do you trust your mother? Of course you do, to be a mother. But what does that mean, trust someone? Trust someone, what, with your wallet? Yeah, I'd probably trust coming with my wallet. I mean, for him to steal it would be too obvious. Trust him with my wife? Well, maybe a little bit less. Trust him with my life? Trust him with what? What does that mean? Do you trust somebody? Trust with what, sir? Because there's no such thing as trust, meaning what? ever happens, I trust you in this situation and in all situations. You cannot do that. I wish we could. Interesting perspective. So, so let's, let's transition a little bit to Bitcoin and then, and then we'll wrap up. So when it comes to Bitcoin, uh, you, 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 know, you have been known as one of the bigger voices, if not the biggest voice in the Bitcoin world. Uh, and you've said, I think your prediction was by the end of 2018, you think Bitcoin is going to hit 78,000. I think your projection was 78,000 by the end of 2018. I, th I think you said a million dollars. I, I didn't make a, 20, a 2018 projection. I, I made a 2020 projection, projection of, of uh, 1 million. I think you said 78,000 to somebody for 2018. I, I, I remember seeing 78,000. If I'm wrong, well, I'm I, wrong. I, I, you I may have seen that, and it may have been written, but I promise you yeah. I did not say okay. that. Uh, quite a few people said forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000. You're probably even higher than that in your estimation if it's going oh, to get to uh, uh, a million <clears throat> by uh, 2020. They're saying uh, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 by uh, the end of 2018 is what many people are expecting That's now. No, my, my figure's at 78,000 by the end of 2018. Yeah, so are you familiar with uh, Jordan Belfort? The guy, the Wolf of Wall Street? Yeah, of course. I interviewed him, I was at his place, and we were sitting down talking about Bitcoin. And I said, tell me what you think about Bitcoin and what's gonna happen. He says, I am telling you, there are not a lot of things I have guarantees of. I guarantee you Bitcoin is gonna have a sudden, from wherever it's gonna go to all of a sudden nothing, and everyone's gonna lose their butt, lose their tail, they're gonna lose everything they have. You have a complete different perspective on Bitcoin because Absolutely. of the way you describe it. 
Tell me your point of view on Bitcoin. Why you think Bitcoin is going to go to a million dollars by 2020? Well, there are a bunch of ways to do it. The most common way is to take the number of users of Bitcoin. Um, because as Bitcoin expands in its user base, both people who, who hold the coin and people who accept the coin for payment, it's skyrocketing. It's skyrocketing. So it's not going to disappear. It can't possibly go to zero. It can only grow as the user base grows. So um, it's impossible. Belfort, I don't care how smart he is, he's wrong. He does not understand digital currencies and how they work. Um, listen, it's, it's Pandora's box. The box has been opened. The spirits are invading the room and they will not go back in. And you have to believe me, digital currencies will replace fiat currencies. Why? Good God, I have a wallet on my phone which is an entire bank. Lending money, sending wires, I don't have to go to the bank. It takes me 10 seconds to do a wire. 10. I've got to go down to the bank, fill out a bunch of forms. Um, no, that's nonsense. Utter nonsense. Do you think that is going to go to zero and, our, and we're going to go back to this incredibly dull and bizarre way of, of, of using money with banks? Please, God. So I got a, I got a rebuttal for that one, a question okay. for you. So yes. for me, you know, I've, I've been in the financial industry um, for a while, Series 766. I'm, you know, I run an insurance company. We, we do pretty well for ourselves. The part that concerns me with Bitcoin, I, I really want to hear your uh, uh, rebuttal on this. When Jamie Dimon is touching $7 trillion of money per day of transactions, that's not just money, that's a lot of political power with a lot of countries that are connected to that $7 trillion. Yes. And so he is one phone call away from so many different prime ministers, presidents, kings, sheiks, whatever you want to call it, because he's touching all these money. I'm not talking small money. We're talking big money here. You yeah, know what I'm saying? Seven trillion, seven seven trillion is a lot of money. a lot of money. Okay. So Half of our gross domestic product. He, if, 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 if it goes in the direction of these 21 million you know, bitcoins being used and 4 million is lost, I think. I don't know the number that was lost. I think it's 4 million of them that was lost, some number like that. Uh, don't you think... A guy like that and these guys who control elections and control all these other things, don't you think they're going to make a phone call and they, you know, they're going to say, hey, listen, Mr. Congressman, Mr. Senator, you want to do this again? You got to make sure you take care of this thing. You cannot let this Bitcoin stuff take off the way it is. This is out of control already. Don't you think they're going to make those calls to figure out a way to do what they've always done, which is, listen, small business owner wants to compete with the big business owner. How do you beat them? Very simple. Big business owner goes to somebody and helps them out financially in the po po political side and says, listen, make the barrier to enter more difficult. How do you do it? More regulations, more licensing, more laws, more rules, more this stuff. And so the new guy cannot come and compete with this guy. Right. He has, in a sense, a monopoly with two other companies, if you want to call it a monopoly. So that is my only concern with a, the argument but, you're making is... But, but you're assuming that Congress make whatever laws they want, obviously. They can outlaw Bitcoin. They can do what they want. You're assuming that there is a possibility of enforcing those laws. That's utter fucking nonsense. You cannot stop a distributed system that is worldwide. There is no law that you can make. If you had one person per, per, per uh, citizen in the country, 400 million enforcers, you still couldn't do it. Well, because the enforcer will have to sleep for some, some point. It's not possible. Okay. Now, admittedly, the way that things were six months ago, yeah. when, when exchanges were centralized, you could shut down an exchange. You can't do that anymore. They've now decentralized exchanges. You can't stop it, you can't shut it down, and you can't know anything about it. So tell me, sir, how will you enforce these magical laws that Congress is going to make? Jamie Demon has no power in this world. So let me ask you this then, a follow-up to that. You remember what happened with China, right, when the China was going through their and, and Bitcoin dropped, I think, from 10,000 to 6,000. It came back up, obviously, to 10,000, but it dropped. And I think in an in a, in a, uh, event or an interview, you said it dropped. That was one of the reasons, because China knew your, you know, whatever it is that was linked to that. And then on top of that, they made it difficult for users to use Bitcoin to yes. buy things. Okay, yes. so go to that. So, yes. so what if somebody says, let's make it difficult for these guys to use their Bitcoin? I don't accept Bitcoin. So then what happens to Bitcoin? But how are you going to make it difficult? What are you going to do to make it difficult? That's my question. I don't accept it. <laughs> well, that's fine. Then you're not going to do business because the guy who does, and you're not going to know he's even accepting it. He's going to advertise on the dark web if he needs to. So what if Chase comes and says, no problem. I own uh, merchant services, authorize.net. They own it. I do business with authorize.net. 
Guess what? Your rates when you accept money from American Express from Visa MasterCard is 1.25. You know how the numbers they have. But if you take Bitcoin, 6.75%. But the banks don't even know what's happening. This is not through the banks. The bank's not involved. The bank has nothing to do with this. They don't even see it. So it's an undercurrent because once you get the exchanges distributed, nobody sees it. The banks have nothing to do with it. They, but in fact, go ahead and do what you want on your credit card. We're not using credit cards. We got Bitcoins. Why do we need credit yes, cards? Yes, listen, let me explain to you where I'm coming from. I own Bitcoin myself, so okay. I'm not coming from a point of view of I'm the, you know, I'm just playing devil's advocate. No, I understand. And a very small but, portion, by the way. But here's the misconception. The misconception is that legislation can have teeth. It's not possible. This is a distributed world. There is no legislation that can touch it. You can't change it. You can't fix it. You can't stop it. You can't control it. You can't direct it. You have no power. I don't, make the laws. Make whatever you want. It will make no difference. You are that certain about it? Well, I'm a technologist, for God's sake. We're talking technology. I mean, a lot of technology people have been wrong in the past before, though. But you are that well, certain no, about well, it. Not wrong when about I their technology. Yeah, this I is technology. You. I'm telling you something. Just like I can tell you, antivirus software does not work because it cannot stop the hackers in the world. I said, I said that earlier. Why? Because it technologically can't. Nothing can. Now, same thing with Bitcoin. You can't stop Bitcoin. This is a fact. Technologically impossible. Cannot be done, sir. Is your number on the million dollars based on a math? And I know you're a math guy. I, I, mm -hmm. I, I think you've got a major in mathematics, right? You, I think you've got a major in mathematics. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and as somebody who's a math guy and your brain is wired, everything is math, did you come up with a million dollar based on a formula or did you come up with a million dollars of assumption of what you think is going to take? I came out of two ways. I looked at the number of users, the user growth, and I, I chose a million because it has to be more than a million. I can guarantee it. Um, I, I came at it that way. It came up with maybe between three and seven million. I came at it the, the mining way, okay, which I believe is a lot more valid. The last Bitcoin to be mined. Okay, there's 10,000 miners. Thank you, Jimmy. The difficulty wait for that last Bitcoin is going to be almost infinite. It's going to cost four to five billion dollars to mine that last coin. And miners are going to do it. The value of that coin has got to be more than the work put in to mine the fucker. So if it costs, let's say, even one billion dollars. All right, so one billion dollars, the last one. Why don't you work backwards from there and find out what the end of 2020 is going to be? So two ways come up with the same number. Between that's five million is probably the the thing. One million, it's way outside the lower range, so I'm, I'm very safe. <laughs> it's, it's fascinating watching your level of conviction that you have it's, in the, it's in not, the product. It's not a level of conviction. I look at reality as objectively, not with what I wish it would be, but what it actually is. And it is, not just Bitcoin, I'm talking about the entire, because there are 2,000 other coins. Bitcoin is not, not it. You know, Bitcoin is less than a third of the total a market cap for alternative currencies. So no, um, you cannot stop them. You cannot change them. You cannot control them. F accept them and try to fix your life to get in line with reality. It, okay, so let me ask you this last question on the topic of Bitcoin. What would your, what would your, uh, uh, if you were to be the devil's advocate of that same exact argument, what is the best argument that you've gotten that's made you question the Bitcoin side? Or have you had any? Has anybody said anything well, or made you look at it? I get or what, what, what if governments don't like it and stop it? I'm going, please, you haven't thought that through, people. How? So, no one has ever shown me a way to stop it. They show me ways to create laws. Well, good Lord, make all the laws you want. We do that all the time. In the 1930s, we made it a law that you could not drink alcohol. We consumed more alcohol per capita during that period than in any period in American history. Today, what are we doing? It's illegal federally and in most states, to smoke weed. You find me a random person that doesn't smoke weed, sir. Well, you don't, perhaps, but maybe you do. <laughs> Somebody in this room does. I can smell it on your clothes. <laughs> Sorry, sir, Jimmy. <laughs> I had a good time with your guys earlier, by the way. Really, really cool team you got here. Well, uh, 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 thank you so much for taking the time. I mean, I, I've enjoyed uh, your perspective on different views that you have. Uh, and, and it's interesting from the place that you come and what you've experienced. And if you, have, actually, if you haven't studied his past and what he's been, been a part of, 
You got a pretty interesting story. Is it true that they're thinking about making a movie about you with Johnny Depp playing your part? Is that actually, is that oh, taking yeah, place? The, the, the Hollywood Reporter reported it, everybody reported it. So that's it. actually taking place with Johnny Depp playing you. Yeah. It was interesting. I was with Donnie Brasco. You remember Donnie Brasco? Joe Pistone, we were with yep. him a couple months ago, and Johnny Depp also played him. And now right. Johnny Depp is playing you. Johnny Depp likes playing these strange roles. I know, Hunter Thompson and, yeah, he, and you name it. Yes. But if you're gonna have anybody play, you may as well be the guy that's the best at playing those parts. I wanted Morgan Depp. Freeman to do it. You're, you're more of a Morgan Freeman guy? I wanted Morgan Freeman, that's what I wanted. You wanted Morgan Freeman to play you? Yeah. That would've been very, uh, uh, now how was he gonna play that? Well, he's a good actor, he's, he can play anything. So he you look at his skin color? You know, how do you know I'm not black with some skin disease, right? <laughs> do you play poker or no? Are you a big poker player or no? I'm not a big poker player. But you do play poker. I'll be happy to play with you. I'm sure I, I would be very happy to donate my money to you based on how you're wired. I, I get a feeling I do. Thank you so much for your time. Really you're enjoyed welcome. it. Truly, thank All you. Right.